All right. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to another Envision Wealth Money Making Sense. We apologize for the few minutes delay. There were some last minute technical hiccups, but we are back on track now, ready to go and ready to see some lovely information doled out to everybody watching today. Uh, as always, these recording these presentations are recorded and will be uploaded to both the Envision Wealth Planning website. Also, if you registered on Zoom, you will be getting a recording link and a short survey after the presentation is done. Today, we are talking about values-based investing, specifically answering the question, can you invest ethically or values-based? Can you invest in your values and still make money? Today, helping us answer that question are three speakers, uh, Envision Wealth Planning, Green Century Funds, and Your Stake, represented by three fantastic individuals and experts in their field, Gigi Norcross, Gabe Risman, and James Brewer. Thank you all for attending today, and thank you to our panelists for speaking with us. So... Jumping straight in, as always, we want to be professional and protected. So we have this big old planning disclosure. If you want to pause the recording later when you get it and read more of it, feel free. Essentially, this is all a bunch of words and fluff to say none of what you are hearing today is advice. It is all education, educational purposes. We are not telling you to go sell your dog and invest in Bitcoin today. After that, <laughs> we are now getting into who is actually talking to you all and bringing you this great education. Who are our presenters? So kicking it off, I'm going to be asking the very simple question to James Brewer. Who are you, sir, in about 60 seconds or less, please? Well, um, uh, I appear to be a soccer and uh, volleyball dad. Um, when I'm not doing that, I am the CEO and uh, founder of Envision Wealth Planning. Uh, we are known, well, what's known as a registered investment advisor uh, in the state of Illinois. Personally, I'm a certified financial planner, uh, considered by many to be the gold standard of financial planning. Um, I'm also a charter retirement planning counselor, a college funding and student loan advisor. That's the pay for ed. Um, I went to the MIT Sloan School of Management, where I learned a few things about investing, and I also uh, um, write, uh, or I'm a contributor to Forbes.com. Um, so that is a quick summary of uh, me. Um, so we'll go from there. Excellent. Thank you very, very much for that quick introduction. Uh, Gabe, same question. Who are you, sir? Please let us know. Thank you so much. It's a great question. It's a uh, question of identity, which many of us have many identities. Um, I think the one that I feel strongest now and in my professional life is honestly still as a climate activist. Uh, I, I got my career started as a student climate activist and realized that, I mean, investments actually have a huge, huge, huge impact on everything that happens in the world, including climate change. And many, many other issues, which we'll be talking about today. Um, and right now, the way that I approach the problems that are really important uh, to me is by being the president and co-founder of Your Stake. And we provide ways for uh, all of you to be able to share your issues that matter most to you with James and team, and also to be able to help diagnose and understand the social impact and, and the values alignment of your investments. And uh, one thing that we're really excited about is uh, is being on this call and especially with uh, Gigi from Green Century who does some pretty amazing work. So thank you all for having me. Excellent, thank you very much for being here. And last but certainly not least, Gigi Norcross, could you please also introduce yourself? Absolutely. That was an awfully nice intro, Gabe. Thank you. Um, Gigi Norcross, um, work with Green Century Capital Management, which is an investment advisor to a family of fossil fuel free mutual funds. Um, I got my start doing work around issues that I care about as a college student. Um, from there, I went to do fundraising um, for the better part of, oh, I don't know, a couple of decades. 
um, and made the move um, to Green Century and to financial services in 2019. And the reason that I did that um, kind of so far along in my career is because I want to make impact around environmental issues and climate change in particular. Um, and I feel like here in values-based investing um, it is a way to do that. I'm originally from West Virginia. Um, my college is noted there, Bethany College, which is in West Virginia. I moved to Chicago for love. My husband grew up here and um, it, and went to the University of Chicago and went you know, was not moving. Um, so Chicago is where I landed um, and is now where I call home. Um, and looking very much forward um, to the conversation today, because while I am a relative newcomer to the space, I feel like that there's um, a lot to be said about values-based investing and the impact that it can have. Excellent. Excellent. Well said. Uh, I personally am also from your neck of the woods, uh, Southwest Virginia State Appalachian Mountains. So I, uh, I can understand some of that background and stuff. And you're right. Absolutely right. It is very, very important to talk about values-based investing and the impacts it can have, which leads me right into our next question for each of our panelists of what is values-based investing? I'm gonna phrase it slightly. What is values-based investing to you? So in about 60 seconds or less, which I know can be a little bit of a struggle, but uh, Gigi, could you start us off with what is values-based investing to you? Yeah, for Green Century, it's all about the green. Um, so it is, um, there's environmental, social, and governance aspects um, it, to our work, mostly just with respect to um, it, using that data, which we'll talk about later. Um, but the reason the Green Century was started in the first place um, it was to give people an opportunity um, it, to invest in something that keeps them out of the most dangerous um, of um, environmental companies. Um, and then um, it puts that um, those investments um, it, to work um, it, through shareholder advocacy to uh, compel companies um, to make changes. Um, and we'll talk some more specifics about that later. So for Green Century, it is all about um, it, doing good work on behalf of the environment um, it, in the financial services space. Excellent. Uh, Gabe, same question to you. What is values-based investing to you? Sure. Uh, I love that we're using the term values-based investing also. That is one that at your stake we use all the time. And it is oftentimes very different from what can be talked about in the media. And it's the, the appropriate term, I think, for this. For me, it's actually, what does values-based investing mean to you, <laughs> right? It's um, who are you as an individual? What issues do you care about? Uh, what charities do you donate to? How do you live your life? Um, how are you active politically? And then how do you incorporate that into your investments and make sure that your financial life is aligned with your personal values and, and what you care about? And that can mean anything from just making sure you're not profiting from industries that are antithetical to your beliefs to uh, what I'm sure Green Century team is going to talk about in terms of shareholder engagement and a lot of uh deep actual impact and, and pushing companies to change. So um, I think that for, for me, it's really personalized and just understanding who you are as an individual and how can your investments reflect what is important. Excellent. Well, well said. What is it to you flipping it around to the audience? Absolutely. And finally, James Brewer, what is values-based investing to you? Well, a little bit of my journey into the industry came about that I wanted to not invest in companies that wouldn't hire me as an African-American. Um, and, you know, that's still a struggle today. Uh, so, you know, I figured that there were companies and we could even pick on some of the S&P 500, the largest 500, and say that some of those actually do that very thing. So why would I not want to give more of my dollars um, invested for my future, like retirement or something to those companies that, you know, potentially would hire me or would show love to women and pay them an equal wage and would be cognizant of what effect that they were going to have um, in the uh, environment in which they actually work. Um, so, you know, but, you know, I always like to also say it's got the word investing. So investing should be to gain something on what you're putting in. Um, and then I think 
you know, talking about values, forgetting about those middle letters of the ESG, because too often we don't say environmental, social, and governance. It's come down to three letters, um, and saying, but what of the what of the elements of those three letters actually matter to you? And let's you know be more specific. And I think you'll see in a little bit uh, that's one of the things that your stake has has done. Excellent. Excellent. It's nice collaboration between between all three and some great great cross points so now we're going to be transitioning into our second question each panelist is going to have about three minutes or less so a little more time uh it's sort of a part a part b uh but we're going to be talking about our wives both personally and also from a company side so now that we have a good definition for what values-based investing actually is why do you, on a personal level first, care about values-based investing? And why does your company uh, specifically care about it? You might blend the two, you might separate them or, or answer them differently than that order, um, but it's gonna be the why for you, the why for the company you're representing. So Gabe, could you please answer why values-based import, values investing is important for you and your state? Absolutely. And um, they are one in the same. Um, as a, I guess as a co-founder, the reason why we founded the company is uh, based on our own personal expression. Um, my co-founder and I actually both were activists together um, and had a lot of background in data analysis just through our studies and finance. And why it matters to me, actually, we, we started out just as academics. We put together a research paper on, man, there's all this talk about socially responsible investing, values-based investing, does it actually do anything? Like what's going on here? Like what is, is this actually meaningful? And we did research, looked at a ton of literature reviews, looked at uh, a lot of actually empirical studies and case studies and examples of what's going on and found that actually, yes, values-based investing can be really meaningful and, and um, actually have impacts on society. And there are some important distinction of ways that it can happen, but the more scale and the more easy it is to align your investments with your values, the the more that that creates a lot of really positive feedback loops and creates positive societal impact. So I think it's as simple as that for us. And I don't need to, to get to the full three minutes. It's just something that we really believe in for making the world a better place across issues of racial justice, gender equality, environment, uh, environmental issues, public health, animal rights, all these different issue areas. Um, investment play a huge role. And, and we found that and then tried to build a product and a company that can help make it, uh, make it better. Okay, excellent. Um, I guess maybe to flesh that out a little bit, we can also add on if you'd like, um, why do you think people should care about it uh, in the way that you and your, your stake Sure. I think what we really try to do is a lot of times values-based investing can be extremely confusing. And when it's confusing, it can be difficult and people don't necessarily feel comfortable taking action when something is confusing and difficult and hard to explain and understand. So our mission and why we created Your Stake is to bring personalization and transparency and simplicity to values-based investing. And that's, uh, hopefully that answers your question, but that's kind of why we exist is to make things more understandable uh, for everyone to feel comfortable taking this action. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, and now, Gigi, could you please tell us why you care about um, values-based investing and why Green Century? Uh, and if you have a little bit of time, I guess kind of that third part of why why do you and Green Century feel like people should, should care? Well, starting with me, um, and then I'll highlight some of the things that are on the slide here um, on the company more broadly. Um, as noted in the introductory part, I made the move to Green Century in 2019, just a few short years ago, because I felt um, that this was a place um, that could generate real impact real quickly um, on a range of environmental issues. 
um, while still generating a competitive return um, for people who choose to um, invest this way. So on the real impact real quickly, um, climate change is here, it's now. Um, it, there, we have no time to waste. Um, it, and the more that we can do to press companies to make changes in their practices um, it, in the name of a better and better protected planet, great. Um, it, so that's why I'm here, um, it is um, it, to do that work. Um, and it also is a smart way. Um, for people to engage in it. So Green Century Capital Management was um, established in 1991. So we've been in the space of sustainable, environmentally responsible best investing for more than 30 years. The company was started in the first place to give average everyday people a way to invest. Our minimums are low. Um, it, you can, with $2,500, invest in one of our funds. Um, it, gives people a way to invest not in environmentally reckless industries like oil and gas um, and then can generate real impact um, through a shareholder advocacy strategy um, as well as through our ownership structure. Um, Green Century is owned by not-for-profit organizations that also generate impact around public health and environmental issues. Um, so there's another slide a little bit later, but we think of our um, impact in three ways, through the funds themselves, um, through our shareholder advocacy work, and then through the work of our owners. There you go. Um, and then we have um, three mutual funds, and they are listed here, um, two of which are equity funds, um, uh, one domestic and one international, um, and the final of which is a balanced fund. And we will talk a little bit more about all of those um, as we get further on into the presentation. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Uh, yeah, sorry, the system's being a little funky today, but we're just doing our best to make it work. Thank you very much for that explanation and telling us a little bit more about the background search. Um, and then last but certainly not least, as always, James Brewer, could you please answer why values-based investing is important to you and why is important for Envision? So probably as the elder statesman of the, the uh, presenters, um, when I was in speech and debates um, in the late 70s, we were talking about the topic of uh, climate and environment. Um, and we were projecting some of the issues that we're seeing today. So I've known about that problem for quite some time. Um, you know, as uh, an African-American, I noted that there were certain things that I didn't see or did see in neighborhoods that uh, had more brown folk um, in them. And, you know, but over time I started understanding that uh, there was some structural stuff going on and companies who potentially didn't mind dumping or not taking care of certain areas because they could. So, um, so as I had the opportunity, um, I, you know, in my, you know, I guess older adult life, when I decided to eventually uh, get into the industry, I wanted to actually do something and look for ways to help clients, um, in, starting with myself and my wife, uh, to be able to help people invest in stuff that was more aligned. Um, and in uh, 2008, I was uh, plucked from all of the Ameriprise advisors for what I was trying to do. Um, and this is a uh, snapshot of that article uh, which was called making money and a difference. Um, and, uh, you know, some people question, well, could you make money? And we'll talk about, can you make money uh, a bit later? Uh, then kind of evolving on that, um, you know, when I started my registered investment advisory firm, um, I wanted to be even more specific and fortunately learned uh, about, uh, uh, you know, green century, as well as what uh, your stake was doing, because I really felt as though that um, it was a bit haphazard in the past of, you know, funds that might be claiming that they were more values-based, but were they really? So that's where kind of Gabe helps out. 
Um, and then uh, eventually I got the opportunity to be a Forbes.com contributor. Uh, so on the next slide, it'll show an article that I wrote that basically said, could one incorporate, um, you know, investing in women's empowerment um, and also be able to retire because I've had people say, but you know, this all sounds good, but will I be able to retire? And unfortunately, even before they even, I guess, to me more thought of that, just naturally some people felt like, well, to do good, doesn't that mean that we actually make less money? But I don't know of a woman who said, you know, I'm okay with investing in a company that pays their women, you know, 70% on the dollar um, because that's going to make me more money. Um, in fact, do they have any job openings for me? Um, I just don't know. I've just never had that be be the case. So sometimes we're kind of quick to make an answer because I think of our concern around the investing side. But, you know, we are investing in companies like companies that could be in the S&P 500 or the Russell 3000 or in world uh, uh, in in the world. Is there more and more companies that, you know, they sell their products here in the U.S., but we don't even think of them as. Uh, not being domestic. So um, I just wanted to set out to go and try to, you know, be be a fixture of that. But even more broadly, rather than just say investing, I asked people, wouldn't you rather have that in your plan, period? So from a financial planning perspective, I'm actually uh, trying to encourage them to tell us what their values are, what they really want to do, and let's see if they do have any compromises. And sometimes that just might mean saving a little bit more money but most of the time, I don't even have to bring that up. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for giving your, your personal whys and telling us a little bit more about why the company itself is, is doing. So now we're, we're moving into our, our larger section here, where each panelist is going to have about seven to eight minutes to kind of go into this. Uh, there are quite a few visuals attached to this, so if at any point things need to be move back and forth, or you'd like to go back to a previous slide, just let me know. No problem at all. We'll make that work. Um, but we're going to be answering how each company actually pursues values-based investing, some of the strategies, some of the components, some of the materials. Um, and you, as the audience, will get to see a little bit behind the curtain about how some of these things work and how the structure is actually, how the, how the pasta is made, I guess. <laughs> so. Uh, Starting uh, Alf with Gabe, why don't you walk us through how your stake actually executes on this idea? Sure thing. So like I kind of talked about at the very beginning, um, values-based investing from our perspective is all about personalization and figuring out what your values are. So we have a couple ways to do that, but the most popular is this behavioral values questionnaire that we developed in collaboration with behavioral research scientists who helped us put together a questionnaire that can get at some of your um, kind of behavioral tendencies instead of just what kind of first comes to mind. So for example, if you go out of your way to reduce your environmental footprint, there's a really, really strong correlation and, and uh, likelihood that you have interest in aligning your values and your investments with uh, a lower environmental footprint as well. So we have the 16 question behavioral questionnaire and that can map to a number of different groupings of value sets. So for example, if you want, oh yeah, there's the seven. So uh, there's friend of animals, planet protector, racial equity advocate, women empowerer, health defender, peace protector, fair player, and human rights defender. And based on the way that you answer your uh, questions, you will be placed into one or several of these eight categories. And those categories all map to underlying metrics. So for example, if you're a vegan um, and you don't eat meat and you think animal lives are just as important as human lives, you uh, might identify as a friend of animals. And you might be interested to know, am I investing in meat companies in my portfolio? Uh, which if you're a vegan, that, that maybe doesn't align with what you're looking for. And uh, create some dissonance. Are you investing in companies that are doing animal testing, particularly if it doesn't even have a medical purpose and it's just for cosmetics? So those are things that we will then automatically be able to populate information and data to be able to show you visuals and help you understand 
what's going on in your portfolio, but we map it to the values that you kind of self-identify into what you care about. Um, we also are able to show information that can be really intuitive and helpful um, that kind of puts things in tangible terms. So for example, if you're interested in the um, uh, animal welfare side of things, we're able to quantify the number of, for example, uh, chickens that you are responsible for or, or cows that have been uh, slaughtered uh, based on your ownership in the companies that uh, are performing those actions to be able to make it very visual and understandable and visceral. And it's not just on the bad side. If you're investing in solar panel companies, how many solar panels are you actually responsible for creating? If you're investing in companies that hire more women, uh, I mean, we're, we're putting those into tangible terms on both the, the positive and the negative side of things. Um, we do have over 100 metrics across those uh, major issue areas and allow for kind of full customization even beyond the ones that we default map to as part of that questionnaire. So that if you have any interest or you see things in the news, you wanna know, am I invested in that? What's going on here? We do have all the data to be able to help you understand from a very holistic perspective um, what's going on within your portfolio. And then one of the main ways that we help to visualize it is by showing these uh, impact comparisons. So I, we, we pulled up um, an example in vision one versus a standard fidelity asset manager. And you're able to see that, hey, by investing in this envision portfolio, you're taking 53% of the toxic air pollution out of your portfolio compared to this standard fidelity manager, or you have 319% more exposure to clean energy companies, which kind of makes it uh, understandable to really see the side-by-side -side difference of what's going on. I don't know if I have screenshots here, but every single thing I talked about making things explainable and transparent, if you want to know 390% more ener clean energy companies, that's amazing. Where are they coming from? You're able to just click on that number and it will show you all of the clean energy companies in your portfolio versus the comparison portfolio and, and what they're actually doing. Are they creating solar panels or electric vehicles or batteries or wind turbine, whatever it might be. You're able to see everything that's going on. Um, and that... Yeah, this is, I think, another uh, page two of that report where things are categorized by color based on their issue area. Um, and the final thing that we really help with, and this is something that I know Gigi will talk about a lot, so I think it's a good transition over as well, is a big part of values-based investing is alignment. It's investing in companies you believe in. It's not investing in companies you don't believe in. And that has, I mean, value from a values alignment and from an investment perspective as well. Um, but a really important part that sometimes gets overlooked, and I'm glad that Gigi will dive into full depth, is shareholder advocacy, which is if you own a portion of a company, you well, let's say let's take it back a step. You invest in some fund or some stock. When you're investing, you actually are a part owner of all of the companies that you invest in in your portfolio. And that gives you a voice as a part owner. One, it makes you responsible for, for what they're doing, partly responsible as a part owner. Uh, that's what we talked about before in terms of how many solar panels you're responsible for. But you also have a voice to be able to influence company management, to be able to get them to improve their practices, their policies on the issues that you care about. And what this shareholder advocacy highlights is showing is if you're investing in a green century fund in your portfolio, or you're investing in whatever other mutual fund, and that mutual fund manager is uh, using your dollars to be able to express your voice and push companies to change, then we're actually showing example stories of how fund managers, so here's a Green Century one, I think this is, uh, Green Century pushes Alphabet to make replacement phone parts available to uh, reduce electronic waste. So that's stories of how your fund managers and your portfolio are having dialogues and maybe even applying public pressure to get companies to uh, improve their impact across your portfolio. So Absolutely. let me just quickly say that I uh, used this particular example uh, that went from the first one. So for those who don't know, the 85 was, it's 85% stock. So when you have stock, then that's where the stock certificates come from that allow 
uh, mutual funds like Green Century to do advocacy. Um, every mutual fund doesn't do advocacy work uh, that still could be considered um, values-based, but the, I'm, we're highlighting Green Century as they're one of the ones who actually do that. Um, so just know that, you know, the reason you're seeing certain firms, um, but the, the, this is an actual real thing in a real portfolio uh, that uh, you could get with Envision. Um, and uh, we, we weren't able to quite get it working with the screen share, but uh, one other thing that I just want to highlight is that uh, these digital reports, uh, some of you may notice the little uh, website underlined hyperlink. Those are, those are real links. They will, these reports will actually take you to the corresponding stories that Gabe was mentioning, um, which just kind of gives further backing and credibility to the fact that we are pulling data from legitimate places and legitimate sources, and you can go read the actual articles and see where they're pulling their sources and resources from. And uh, yes, it was an intentional that we wanted to highlight something that we were doing in collaboration with Green Century on advocacy, uh, which takes us into a very neat transition straight into Gigi. Uh, talking about shareholder advocacy, and again, that larger question that we're answering right now about how does Green Century actually execute on values-based investing? Yeah, so I'm going to concentrate this, my seven or eight minutes, um, on shareholder advocacy. Um, it's not the only part of our um, investment strategy, um, but, but it is a prominent part of our investment strategy, and so we'll spend um most of my time talking about um uh, talking about that in this um this section so taking a step back what is shareholder advocacy um we think about it in three buckets um proxy voting engaging with companies and then shareholder advocacy where we're pressing companies to make real world real world change um as a mutual fund we consider proxy voting so we vote um on behalf of our shareholders um it, to on company resolutions. We think of that as a baseline responsibility. Um, it, there are some companies, mutual fund companies out there um, it, that talk about shareholder advocacy when really you look under the hood and all they do is proxy voting. Um, it, we think of proxy voting as something we gotta do. We have to do that. We're, we're a mutual fund company and we publish our proxy voting criteria and voting record online and we um, vote our proxies um, with environmental guidelines um, in place. Then company engagement, we have a full staff um, of shareholder advocates in-house um, and um, those really amazing people um, divide things up primarily by issue area. Um, so we've got a person on our team that's a plastics ex expert, and we've got a person on our team that's a forest expert, and we've got a person on our team that is an SPTI or emissions um, expert. Those people um, then survey the lay of the land with respect to our holdings um, every year to identify where are their opportunities. So Green Century Fund is not just invested in clean energy or solutions based um, companies, um, but we're invested in lots of companies. We're invested in Procter & Gamble. We're invested in Apple. We're invested in, so these are not companies that you think of as environmental necessarily, but they are companies that are interested in sustainability. Um, and so we look um, at companies to engage where there are risks. Um, and then our team of advocates um, pursue conversations with those companies. And sometimes all it takes is a conversation um, because companies like the ones that are in our holdings um, sometimes want to do the right thing and just need to be shown a path towards doing it. Um, so that's the second piece. The third piece is the advocacy where we will really press companies to make changes. Um, and we do that um, through um, filing of shareholder resolutions, um, if it comes to that, um, it, to make public um, what it is that we are pressing a company to change, um, and then um, what the shareholders think um, about that. Um, and our um, our advocacy really um, boils down to um, pressing companies to adopt um, it needed environmental policies in their operations or changing sourcing standards 
or implementing stronger um, the practices across their full um, supply chain. So again, shareholder advocacy, what is it? We're a mutual fund company. And so we have a lot of power by virtue of the number of investors um, that, that we have behind us. And we use that to communicate to companies um, what um, what we'd like for them to be doing um, and then engaging um, those companies through our in-house team of expert advocates. Um, so then moving on to the next slide, just a snapshot um, of some of our um, big wins from the 2022-2023 season. The QR code will take you to a bigger piece. So if you take a, um, a snap of that, um, it, you will get to a larger piece of material um, about our 2022-2023 season. Um, the nutshell numbers are we engaged 60 companies. Um, we fired, filed 32 shareholder resolutions. And from that, um, it secured um, 20 substantial policy victories. Um, and highlighting just a couple of them, Costco um, is one I like to talk about a lot um, because we've engaged Costco on a number of different issues um, over time. Um, at this particular win last year um, it was a commitment um, to reduce emissions across their full supply chain. Um, so not just emissions that are company, coming from the company itself, which is impactful, um, but also um, in vendors um, that Costco uses. So full um, supply um, chain emissions reductions commitment from Costco last year. Um, and then Apple, Gabe already mentioned it and it was in um, his slide. Um, we've engaged Apple now a couple of times um, on um, a range of issues and um, some significant wins there were finally publishing material on how you can repair your own stuff um, so that that stuff doesn't have to go into a landfill and get replaced. Um, so that's um, so that's key. Also in the category of e-waste, it's not on the list here because it just has happened, um, engaged Alphabet um, or Google um, to extend the life of Chromebooks, um, which is going to present prevent really millions of computers um, just to becoming obsolete um, right away um, and going into uh, going into landfills. So these are the kinds of things that we do um, and the kinds of companies that we engage um, and the result that comes from that, um, which um, it can be quite impactful. You know, another snippet is um, we've engaged Coca-Cola a couple of times um, around a couple of different issues over the years. The most recent um, win resulted in a commitment of Coca-Cola to reduce their production of um, new plastics by 3 million metric tons by the year 2025, um, which is obviously just right around the corner. That's a huge amount of plastic that's not gonna get produced um, in the first place. Um, it, it equates to taking 200,000 plastic bottles out of the waste stream every minute for a year. Um, so, you know, this is what we try to do um, is engage companies and from our engagements with those companies, um, deliver very meaningful, very impactful um, policy reforms. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, so I've talked a lot about shareholder advocacy, and that's like the second part of our impact three part um, three part strategy um, the Parts one and three are we support nonprofit organizations um, because that's who own us. Um, and then we avoid the most um, onerous of industries in the first place. Um, and then I'll quickly run through the next slide really in 30 seconds or less. Um, it, this is, and I know that James will talk more about sort of how you can make money um, through um, a company like Green Century and investing in, a, in one, of our, one of our funds. Um, but, but we make use of value-based screens, um, ESG criteria, um, and notably ratings. Um, and then finally, we are divested completely from fossil fuels um, across our full fund family, um, which is three mutual funds. Thank you so much for, for taking us through that, walking us through some of the process and, and some really, really cool wins about how you guys have effectively engaged in the market and affected some really impactful change. Thank you for letting us know about that. 
And as a very nice and simple transition, while we're talking about investment strategies and the actual process of getting people's money, now that we know the values, now that we know there are people who are actually doing something about your values, how could you as the average person uh, actually put your money into a system like this? And what kind of investment process would that look like? So James Brewer, if you could take us through how Envision helps people connect in these ways and actually get their money into a values-based system. So uh, at Envision, um, I use this investment process. What's not shown on here is that I believe that people should start with some goal in mind. Uh, so let's say it's retirement, but retirement as in I need $5,000 a month when I retire or whatever number that is the right one for you. Um, and we back up into that. And then based upon all the other factors, once we get to investing, saying what um, risk and return um, would make sense with your ability to save money or if you've already accumulated money. Um, and then that is then the number one piece where it's saying, strategically allocate for the goal. So in that one slide, we showed you the 85% um, stock, but we also have 100% stock all the way down to 20% stock, 80% bond portfolios. Um, so that's how we figured out. Now, then once we go to the next level, um, it begins to say, okay, what, what are we going to include? What are we going to include? So that's where I started going with your state. So thanks, Gabe, for creating a company to make it easier on me. Um, so, you know, then we start to say, well, at our company, we, we basically have three values in particular that we have put in kind of what I call my standard models. Um, and that's the racial um, equity advocacy, gen, uh, women's empowerment, and the uh, Gabe calls it planet protection. Um, so that's kind of what we start with. And depending upon the person, we can expand beyond that uh, to, to more criteria. Um, and then through that kind of screening process of potentially exchange traded funds and mutual funds, um, I had, uh, or we have a number of, of mutual funds that meet our criteria uh, and Green Century meets a couple of those uh, but their process was strong. So essentially I could look at all of them, but, but today we actually use two out of three of uh, their funds. Um, it's also possible going into the next layer uh, that I've said that you have to ingest ingredients based on platform. So there are people who come to us now, which we can actually help you invest your money in your 401k directly into your 401k, 403b, 457, but you don't have the expanse of choices that I do because we use the Charles Schwab platform, which then um, is one of the reasons why you need something like your stake because there's just so many possibilities. But usually in a 401k, 403b, 457, there might be 20, um, you know, usually a few less than that, and you typically get defaulted. Um, into a target A mutual fund if you've done nothing, which those target A mutual funds can invest in anything. So you've seen today that if you invest in anything, expect that you've got you know some of the things that don't fit with your values because no one's thinking about it. So potentially we if we were to do that work for you in that arena, we may have to you know use different funds on occasion, which is rare. We do find that there is some fund that does screen. Um, but sometimes we're just trying to do the best we can with what we're given. Um, so that's what that adjusts for ingredients based on the platform. Uh, the next slide kind of goes a little bit deeper in something called modern portfolio theory. Uh, Gigi's husband may have learned about this at University of Chicago, which is where that part got started. Um, but basically it says, or somebody who won a Nobel prize in finance said, hey, what if we mix stocks and bonds together um, in different combinations. Um, I kind of use the example of if you mix salt and pepper and had something that was all salty, something that's all pepper, and you had you know 25 to 50%, you change the blends, 
you're going to get a different flavor profile. Depending upon how you like to season your food, you might like one over the other. In my case, I try to have it fit with how we're going to help you um, actually reach your goals. So that's we're kind of taking the funds and that, that we end up picking and, and changing the percentages to get this kind of uh, uh, efficient looking uh, curve. Uh, I'm forgetting my next slide. So yeah, we kind of went through uh, briefly that you know these are the three things that we actually uh, screen for naturally in you know let's say all of the things that we do. So I have been thinking about this a bit, and if anyone's familiar with LEED certification, so we're talking about sustainability today. Um, you know, a a building um, from an architecture standpoint, my wife's an architect, might be how I came up with this in the first place, but it's an architect. So some are called bronze, and then you could be silver, gold, or platinum. So the higher up, just you know, the the board that certifies has just said you are more sustainable relative to something else. Uh, sometimes, depending upon cost factors, um, you know, especially if you're retrofitting something, um, bronze might be the best you can get. Uh, but if you're starting from a new platinum, could be something that you could get to. So I was just trying to use that as an analogy. So we have solutions that, you know, basically if you have like $1,000 um, all the way up to $500,000, um, we have different solutions for you. Um, as you move up, it's not that, um, oh, and the, the Green Century should say balance, the Green Century Balance Fund. And I realized, GG, it should be 2,500, not 3,000. So people, if you have 2,500, um, you're, you're in good shape. Um, but, but, but you don't have to move out. So it's really kind of a continuum that some of them require a minimum dollar amount. Um, and, but, and, and some have lower minimums. So we're giving you ones across the uh, a spectrum. So the Invasion Justice Series um, is uh, kind of something that I created. I particularly like the name. And you know, if you like climate justice or you like racial justice or uh, women's justice, I always thought, why not Envision Justice? So there, there you have how I stumble on the name. Um, and that slide. So um, we've partnered, um, of course, with the two firms that are here uh, today. Uh, we do use uh, Gabe's incredible values assessment. I think recently we had someone who got like seven out of eight, Gabe, and they might have gotten eight because they told me that one of the questions they found it difficult to answer for some reason. Um, but mm -hmm. they, they, so some people it's a lot, and some people it's like one. Um, mm -hmm. And some, I think, are actually afraid to find out what the score is going to tell them. Um, and then, you know, we definitely make sure that we're, you know, leveraging that and we can give you that feedback uh, with the reporting um, on your own portfolio that you have today. And potentially, if you use one of the other solutions that we have uh, with us for Green Century, we do use the, the standalone uh, Green Century Balance Fund and their uh, MSCI um, fund is in our Envision Justice series in the uh, uh, world or um, international category. Um, and we love their advocacy. So a little bit about the Envision Justice, I can't say too much because there's lots of disclosures and a whole nother presentation. If you'd like to uh, learn one-on-one, -on -one, we'd love to share it with you because we've got a pretty big presentation that we've done on that. Uh, but basically through the period from 10-9, 2017 through 12-31-2022, using Morningstar data, uh, which is about two blocks away from where we're at here in Chicago. Um, so you can go get mad at them if you find out that it's wrong, but I think it's pretty good. Um, that, um, you know, using those screens we told you about, that we compare ourselves to the Vanguard Life Strategy Fund Series uh, as well as the Fidelity Asset Manager series. Um, those are already kind of pre-done, if you will, asset allocation models that do go across that modern portfolio theory uh, that, that we showed you. Um, and that I can tell you that 
um, our ESG or our Envision Justice series portfolios, um, outperform them um, on a risk adjusted return basis. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, what most people want to see is higher balances um, rather than seeing numbers that look all fancy. So, so thank you so much for everybody giving us kind of a breakdown of how each company. Uh, we are coming to the end of our time here, uh, just with about six minutes left. So in less than that, in about five minutes, James Brewer is going to close us out with just a final information to action. You guys now know why uh, everybody here speaking today is involved with this, what they're actually involved in, how their companies manage it, and now specifically talking about um, how one individual or several individuals could actually engage in this process and become part of this great little triangle group of Green Century, Your Stake, Envision, and other companies and individuals that are also participating in this area. So um, I won't even need six minutes. Um, so fortunately, um, Gabe's company developed something um, that we're going to show you. So they have this portfolio checkup. Why not get a checkup? The dentist tells me I should go twice a year, right? So, I mean, why not go get a checkup? So, um, but uh, th this is an incredible tool, I feel. So the first thing that, you know, you put in your uh, values and we can put your values, it doesn't have to be ours, but you see ours here. And it says compared to what you currently have, um, this is what you get. So in fact, the one that we're showing you, uh, it's from a real customer and they were told that their uh, money is invested in their values. Uh, so you can see not that there were zero values, but we improve on, on their values in the, the Envision Justice. Uh, in this one, we're using our, our all uh, stock portfolio. Um, most people like the idea of returns. So blame Gabe because it's his report that we co copied. So it's not uh, something that Envision cut and pasted to create something. But thanks Gabe for making us look good. Well, actually, I think the portfolios are doing what they're supposed to do. Um, so in comparison, so this person is now going to get, I'm going to call it return on value. We have, we, 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 I just came up with that for the first time, Gigi and Gabe, return on your values. We don't talk about return on investment, right? Let's talk about return on value. So in this case, by adding the dimension of values and trying to be more values aligned, they've improved their returns. So um, we would love for you to take advantage of uh, taking on one of these uh, portfolio checkups. Um, you can just do so, use the QR code, um, or you can simply email um, OPS um, at envisionwealth.us. Um, really, we'll just need your statement. Um, and um, from your statement, um, we will be able to get that uploaded and let Gabe's system you know, see where you stand. Um, and, you know, see if working with us, either potentially in the Green Century Balance Fund, if you don't have the Envision Justice Series um, minimum dollars, um, but, you know, you did see that we have other options for you um, to help you on helping to align your values with um, your goals. Thank you very much. Um, once again, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you again, Gigi and Gabe for coming in and speaking with us. We do have just a spare two minutes here. Uh, Gabe or Gigi, I'm gonna leave it open. Do either of you have closing thoughts or final kind of pieces of educational encouragement to, uh, to the viewers? I don't think I do except to say um, that on our website. Um, it, there is also a relatively recently updated guide to fossil fuel free investing, um, which covers things like how to advocate for that within your 401k. Um, it, so if that's of interest to you, you can check out our website and very easily get to it. Yeah, that is Green Century Funds. Green Century Funds. GreenCentury.com. 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 Gabe, any, any final closing thoughts? 
no, I, th I think we covered everything and just really happy to be on here with, uh, with these amazing folks. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Once again, thank you to our viewers out there. Thank you to Gigi and Gabe for attending with us today. Envision Money Makes Sense. Uh, we host these once a month right on Zoom. Uh, you can register for these very, very easily. We have links on the website. And uh, again, we send out the recordings afterwards to all of the attendees. And we'll be also sending out information uh, about your stakes, more information, and some more information about Green Century. Uh, so you please feel free to look up those individuals and just the great work that they're doing. And we really appreciate them taking the time to speak with us today. Anyway, I hope you all have a great rest of your week, one day till Friday, and uh, just uh, just have a great values-based time.